Ravinda, so thank you so much for coming into the studio today. A total pleasure. Thank you for having me. It is our pleasure to have you, to host you, um, and for the wonderful lunch that you cooked, me and the team. It was very, it was very comforting, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, really comforting. I love it. Um, I want to talk to you about, obviously, comfort and joy. I want to talk about, like, how you infuse love into your recipes and what the inspiration behind them are. And we were just talking before I cut us off because you were talking about the medicinal sort of effects of food and how that sort of maternal influence is somewhat lost because of, you know, the lack of cooking skills that we have and the, yeah. the lack of sort of time we actually put into our kitchen. So um, I wonder where we should kick off in terms of... I mean... I think we can talk about the maternal kitchen. Let's right? talk about that. Because yeah. that is something that really has been one of my philosophies at the restaurant, at home. It's like this incredible, you know, generational knowledge, intergenerational knowledge that gets passed down from one woman mm. to another. Um, and how we, we're sort of losing touch with it. But I really wanted to celebrate that. because these women are so marginalized, they don't get the platform that I have had the privilege to have. And I really, they have been my greatest teachers. They have been my greatest gurus. I have learned and gleaned so much knowledge and wisdom yeah. from not even them teaching me, just spending time in their kitchens. It's like osmosis. Yeah. You know, they're kind of, they know how to, you know, what sequence spices go into, you know, ghee or fat or whatever they were using. Um, and, and intuition for when things are cooked, when they need a little bit more cooking. Um, and, you know, for, for, for my grandmother, for example, um, she never went to the pharmacy or the doctor. The kitchen was prescriptive for her. Yeah. So her all her prescriptions came from the spice cupboard. And we're losing so much of that knowledge. And it's something that I'm always really, really keen to kind of bring back and, yeah. and celebrate. Um But I think essentially the maternal kitchen, the intent is what is really important. It's like, what intention are you cooking with? And it's the intention to nurture, to nourish, to look after, to show love. Food was their love language. Yeah. You know, my mother wasn't this kind of woman who hugged you or kissed you all the time. Her love language was food. Um, I love that. It's so yeah. interesting. And, and I think... Uh, Potentially, although I'm quite a, quite a cuddly person, but <laughs> I think my my love language is also definitely food. It's how I show people that I care for them. Yeah. Um, you know, and spending time cooking something for someone is is just a really wonderful way of showing love for that person. Yeah, definitely. How do we reignite that sort of kitchen, uh, that maternal kitchen? How do we re sort of educate ourselves about? The beauty of spices, not just from a flavor point of view, but from a medicinal point of view, a self-care point of view. I know you do some wonderful stuff at the restaurant where you have brunches, weekends you invite speakers. I still haven't been to one of those. I need to yeah. make sure that I'm I'm, I'm right, ready for some of those uh, tickets and stuff. But uh, I, I'm interested in how like you are approaching this this issue and this problem, and and, and what do you think we should be um, leaning well, into? Part of it for me has been that that is the philosophy in the restaurant. So when I when I teach my team to cook, it's often in that very in the same way that my mother taught me to cook, that very kind of maternal way of doing things, teaching them about produce, teaching them about, you know, my mother didn't waste anything. So mm. that is a big part of what we do. And I think that one of the things that I often talk about is um, where our food comes from and the people who grow it for us or who make it for us, amazing producers. We use, you know, incredible producers at the restaurant. And, um, you know, for me, there's this sort of invisible humanity. Every time that we sit down to eat a meal, there is a person present at the table that mm. you can't see. Mm. But that is the person who planted the seed, who nurtured it, who watered it, who um, plucked it out of the ground, stored it, drove it to cargo. There's this incredible chain of humanity behind everything we eat. And often, particularly when our produce is coming from abroad, There's there's a level of sacrifice because I've I've been to those farms. I've seen how those people will give us the best of what they have and then keep the second best for themselves. And if you know that and you're present to that, you really don't waste food. Mm. You're very careful in the way that you cook. You really respect that that whatever it is, a watermelon or a 
potato or whatever it is, you're very aware um, of of the work that has gone into that. And I think that's what my my grandparents, you know, I grew up in Kenya on this incredible allotment, a shamba that my grandfather had. And just watching this very deep respect, love, awe, yeah. um, a very deep spiritual relationship that he had with the land. And it's only now, and actually it was during lockdown that I really started thinking about it. And, you know, why was he so attached to this plot of land? You know, it was just, it wasn't anything spectacular. It was like a few yards of, of soil. Mm. And yet he spent so much of his time there. And I think for someone who had come from so little, to have a patch of soil that was so beautiful, you know, he grew organically. There was, weren't any fertilizers put down. It was all very natural and it was so benevolent. And that gratitude that he had was because he'd known scarcity. And I think we are so lucky we get everything all year round, anytime we want it, you know, delivered in yeah. five seconds if we want it. Um, but it wasn't always like that. And I think we need to re-engage with that idea that food is actually um, precious that it's a blessing that we have it, um, that we should be grateful for what we have and really learn to take care of what we have. And, and when we're cooking, to really engage with it, to that interplay between you and the ingredient is so important. Mm. And like I was saying earlier, when we were cooking together, in these times that we're living through, where we seem to have such little time, first of all, you know, the luxury of time, I find that there's such mindfulness when you're in the, the kitchen. Yeah. It's, I, I love being in my home kitchen. I cook at the restaurant, but actually my favorite thing is to cook at home because there's silence. It's about me, the ingredient, the pan. Mm. And I find that really healing and meditative in itself understanding and being grateful for all these wonderful ingredients that you have, not taking them for granted, not wasting things. And then also in these times that we're living through where we have such a lot lack of control about what's going on in the world politically or anything, to be a show a kind of activism in what we choose to cook, who we support, with the money that we have when we our buying choices are mm. so incredibly powerful are you going to support the industrial you know horrid you know uh, industry that food comes through or are you going to you know support a local farmer or your yeah. local you know supermarket or you know corner shop or you know that in in itself is an activism but then what you decide to put your into your food is also a, a form of, you know, controlling your own kind of health and destiny. And I think that is um, is really important. And that's why I think people who are afraid of the kitchen should embrace it, because yeah. I think they would find that meditation and, you know, things bubbling away is, is very relaxing. And, um, and, yeah, having a choice. I love that idea of leaning into the scarcity mindset and also cooking and choosing where you spend your pounds, dollars, euros as a form of activism as well, yeah, as a completely. form of shaping your food landscape. And I yeah. think this is something that we've talked about previously on the podcast where, you know, even though organic food isn't always pesticide free, even though organic food doesn't always have extra nutrients in it uh, or a, 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 a a noticeable difference in flavor you are choosing a food landscape that is a lot more sustainable Completely. that is a lot less polluted yeah and if you can lean into that and uh, yeah. that afford to to buy more organic produce you are essentially on a march as part of a sort of movement towards a more sustainable and, and fair system. Completely. But it's not even just about, um, you know, supporting um, organic farmers per se or buying more expensive produce. But if you can support your local like corner shop, mm. for example, that's a wonderful thing. You're building a community. You're helping your neighborhood and your community thrive. That's a wonderful, yeah. powerful thing. I often think that as a bit of a glib example, but like, you know, when people choose to purchase a coffee from like a major franchise, yeah. I'm always thinking like there's a really good independent coffee yeah. store that 
know exactly who they're growing from, have perhaps even roasted the beans themselves, that is right next door selling the coffee at a very, very similar price point. Yeah. You choose to go for like, and I, I always boggles my my mind. I don't understand why, because I'm maybe it's because I'm a bit of a coffee snob as well. And I, you know, <laughs> I choose my beans. And I'm very, very sort of precious about the types of beans and the amount of ratio to you know, brewing time, all the rest of it. But like, I just can't get my head around why people choose the franchise yeah. over because it. it is a form of activism as well. You're supporting a local store. Well, I mean, for 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 us, for our business model at Jikoni, our ideal when we started the business was how can every single line of our PL be doing something positive and good? Oh, I love that. And you know, whether it's who we're buying from, whether it's um, you know. Uh, our our refuse you know where is the refuse going is it going into landfill or are we choosing a company who's disposing of it correctly who's who's um you know composting uh food waste that kind of thing mm. um who who do we support in terms of where is our energy coming from who does our banking is it a green bank who's going to it's all oh, wow. these You've things really gone down to like detail, the right? last how do we empower our team how do we empower our community through our spend yeah. and i think restaurants are so powerful and we spend so much money right there's so much money going out and if you can do it in a way that you know every single pound that's spent in the restaurant or comes out of the restaurant is is positive then you have something that feels sustainable, that feels like it's part of a community, that feels like um, it's a beacon of a community, which is what restaurants, I think, should be. They mm. should, I feel like when you have restaurants or businesses that are doing really good things in a in a neighborhood, it spreads to the community. Totally, totally. A, a lot of people who may be restaurant owners themselves or people who understand the pressures on restaurants, particularly right now, might listen to that or watch that and be like, well, how on earth are you able to make those right choices that are activist choices in themselves and still turn a profit? Because it is really, well, really hard for you guys. I mean, margins are so thin in hospitality, but I think it's the thing that I'm, one of the things I'm most proud of is that we have shown that you can be carbon neutral, you can be buying from a biodynamic farm and you can still be turning a profit as a business. Wow. Maybe not as huge a profit as people who, who you know, don't make these choices, but it's important and there's longevity and we feel that what we're putting out, you know, into the world is is good. Um, it, it just feels good. It's a better way of doing business for me. It's like, what's the point of just doing business for business sake and just for the bottom line mm. you know if you have purpose it's it's far more important and i think for team and for culture particularly in in times where um you know hospitality has traditionally been a very transient industry you know people come they go we're really lucky because we've held on to really brilliant people for yeah. you know six of the seven we've been open seven years and for six years 13 of us have worked together wow. and that's incredible and i think it's because we all feel a similar sense of purpose we all believe in the power of positive business and what we're trying to do and achieve and yeah. like i said to you earlier i you know i haven't ever wanted a michelin star or that that's not been my purpose that's not been my aim my aim is simply to make people feel happy, to make people feel content, to make them feel looked after. And, you know, um, the word restaurant comes from the French word to restore. And I always say that if you're not restoring people when they come through your doors, you're just not doing your job correctly. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I didn't know that about the, yeah. the, the word restaurant. That's Completely. And, I, you know, restaurants, are so you have such... It's such a privilege and a joy because you have two, two and a half hours with a stranger and you have that time to transform someone's day, week, month, whatever it is. You don't know what's happening in their personal life. But when they come in, you have that opportunity to engage with them and serve them something that makes them feel good, happy, healthy, whatever it is, you know, looked after and It, that I feel is a real privilege and I always say to my team you know it is about what can you give of yourself that doesn't appear on the check at the end of the day and that is where 
true service and true oh. hospitality comes in. You know, that idea of seva, yeah. both seats, yeah. you know. Yeah. To be able to give service to someone is a really beautiful thing and not to charge them for the smile or that extra care or that extra attention to detail or remembering which wine that they loved last time that they came in and surprising them with a glass of it. Yeah. All those little touches are, you know, a pleasure for us to yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I love that. And I love the sort of like um, uh, intertwinement there with Seva, which is this concept within Sikhism of always delivering service and, and having a portion of your your day or even your paycheck of like how you're uh, supporting your communities. Um, I want to go into a bit more detail on your, your background that you alluded to a little bit earlier because you were born in Kenya. That's right. And your early influences appear to come from your family who had this you know, scarce pot of land and there was a, a real sort of appreciation for growing and Um, how how did your your background influence the style of cooking that you are known for, which is this no borders cooking? Um, well, I think that that really came from becoming an immigrant. Um, so I came to this country when I was seven years old. And it was a real shock to my system because no one had really told me that we were going to be moving here. And I had a very privileged upbringing in Kenya, you know, this beautiful house and land and, you know, an ever blue sky. And, you know, it was wonderful. And then when we came here, it was like we were living in a, sh a flat above a shop with no central heating, no carpets. Like we were literally starting from scratch. And it was it was November and it was freezing and I was like seven years old and, you know, you 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 feel completely alienated and discombobulated from, you know, because you, you just don't know what's going on. And I found safety and reassurance in, kitch in the kitchen. Mm. And I think there is something when you're an immigrant of that steady ticking of meal times because it's all so overwhelming. So if you can get through breakfast, if you can get through lunch and you can get through dinner, you've got through your day and then tomorrow is another day. And that is wow. how you kind of settle one meal at a time. Yeah. And I think that's why cooking is so important for me. And the kitchen also becomes then a portal for you to connect with your ancestry, your past. And for me, you know, whenever I was feeling lonely or sad or feeling alienated, being in the kitchen reminded me of my grandmother who we'd left behind, um, reminded me of Kenya, you know, those ingredients, those smells that I was used to. But the no borders thing happened because I... You know, I'm I'm many things. I'm I'm East African, Indian. I'm British. Um, I am also the product of all those really warm, wonderful immigrant communities that I grew up around, mm. whether it was our Polish neighbors or the lovely people in the local Turkish shop. And when you're growing up around all these influences, they feed naturally into your your own kind of culinary heritage. And I suppose it's a rec reconciliation of your past mm. and your present. And when that comes together, like these seemingly really disparate kind of um, influences, they're so revelatory and they're so incredible. And particularly when it comes to food, that mixing of influences yeah. creates something new. And I think that is what immigrant food is about. It comes from people who have the ache for what they've left behind, but then the wonder of their new landscape. It comes from those feelings where you come to a new landscape and you know nothing and everything seems so barren because you, you haven't got the things you were used to. You know, there are no more mango trees in the garden anymore. <laughs> But then, you know, suddenly what what was barren becomes really abundant because you find new ingredients that can mimic those things or remind you of those things. So a classic example is, you know, like mango achar. We used to make mm. mango achar every summer in, in Kenya. And of course, over here, you, you 
don't get mangoes are not cheap, you know, particularly when they're out of season. Just for our listeners, can you explain what a mango achar? So achar is basically a pickle. Mm-hmm. So it's a preserve. Um, so you know, we'd have lime pickle or like you know, a carrot pickle or whatever it was. But the mango was really special. Mm. And then you know, I remember my mom making it um, in in England, and what she was doing was using Bramley apples. Because ah. they have the same sharpness as a raw mango would, That's so and a similar texture, and then but obviously much much cheaper to mm. do. So, but you get that same kind of tanginess and deliciousness that you would with a raw mango. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's so, a, yeah. that's so interesting that I, I wouldn't have ever made that connection, but I guess it comes out of that scarcity mindset coming back to something you, you mentioned earlier about like you just use what you have at your disposal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And this is what I mean about maternal cooks. They have this incredible instinct. They just know somehow. They have this superpower of knowing what's going to work. And I just think it comes from years and years of kind of genetic wisdom that's just yeah. kind of passed down and yeah. it's just stored somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And I love that sort of uh, analogy of it being osmosis. It sort of just kind of filters through you yeah know, just by being close to the, the source of influence and you know we were talking about no borders cooking we just made a cacciapepe kale orzo soup yeah uh, you know and it's just uh, it ch- with chickpeas and you know I, I don't think my brain would have conjured something as vastly different than those and it just works and I guess you know your background being uh, from from East Africa Indian British sort of allows you a new lens or, or a novel way of looking at ingredients. And, and plus, you know, the the examples that you just talked about with the Bramley apple pickle. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, travel as well really feeds my mind. I love traveling. The first thing I always do when I'm anywhere, when I'm abroad is I go to a local market or a supermarket mm. and I'm fascinated with ingredients and collecting ingredients from around the world and going into people's kitchens. I mean, the best food you get is in people's houses, right? So if you can make friends with people, Um, you know, it's wonderful. You go into their kitchens and, and you learn something. And I think food is a really wonderful way to sort of get people's stories because when you sit down with food, suddenly people just open up to you and yeah. you hear all the... And I really respect Claudia Roden for that. You know, uh-huh. she would just kind of take off, go into people's kitchens, and then these women would just A, share their recipes, yeah. <laughs> but B, tell her their stories, which I think is so wonderful. So that I think that's what I really enjoy about food, that yeah. it's not always just about the greediness of eating it, but it's about the stories that come with it, yeah. the conversations. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is something that, you know, particularly here at the Doctor's Kitchen, we're really mindful of, that you can't reduce food to the sum of its nutrients and the sum of, like, what it can do in the human body. And that that's all you think of. You've really got to think about it through the lens of, What joy does it bring you? What comfort does it bring you? What love is it expressing to you? And like I was saying, you know, comfort food means different things to different people. And I think in a traditional sense, it might mean, you know, a big vat of mac and cheese or a (laughs) pie or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with that. But for me, comfort food and food that brings you joy is the food that you never, ever get bored of eating, Mm. that you could eat on repeat all the time. You know, things like things that make you feel well things that make you feel nurtured and nourished things that make you feel content things that obviously bring you joy um you know that for me is comfort food so for me comfort food could also be a really wonderful salad that has an an amazing dressing or a dal that feels really wholesome and that makes you feel well i mean dal is such a wonderful thing and there are so many different things you can do with lentils right It, they're never boring. I, Mother Joffrey called dal LSD, right? <laughs> Life-saving dal. Because A, it's really affordable, but also you can do so much with it. And mm. whether you're a prince or a pauper, everyone in India eats dal, yeah, right? Yeah. And um, there are just so many things you can do. It You never get bored of it because you can make it in so many different ways. Um, and I, I, I love it. And it always brings me a sense of comfort. It yeah. brings me nostalgia as well, because I always think about my mum when I make dal. Yeah. And it brings me sheer joy. Yeah, absolutely. 
I'm going to do a quick fire round with you, actually, as we bring this to a close. I want to know a couple of things that uh, you always have in your pantry, fridge, and freezer. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. I haven't prepped you in any of these things. So, <laughs> in your pantry, what are your? I know you've got probably got like an expansive pantry. What is your? What is the thing that you always need to have in your pantry to cook yourself comforting and joyful food? Condiments. Condiments, okay. Oh my God, I'm like the condiment queen. <laughs> Pickles, chutneys, nice. jams, ketchups, um, you know, pickled vegetables, chili oils. I'm obsessed. I think I love chili oil. I love chili oil yeah. so much. I love Poon's chili oil. Mm. Um, I love the, what's the other brand at the moment? Lee they Kung do, Ka, is that n- the... That's, that's a traditional brand, but there's another one. I can't remember what it's called now, but they do like a cashew one, which is just Oh, I know the unbelievable. one you mean. Yeah, I think there's actually an Irish brand. Um, I think it's called Ma- Masu or something. That's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love this, but I love poons and I yeah and I leak them cu- uh, the um, crispy chili the oil. Crispy chili oh my is god, a for me. so good, yeah, so good. So I think for me, and I I love how pickles and and these kinds of things they bring lightness mm. and and sort of texture and interest. So you mm. could have a really, you know, simple broth, and then you. Put chili oil on it and it just, you know, completely or you have a really simple dal and then you have an achar or a, a pickle and it just completely changes it. Totally, yeah. yeah. Actually, as a sidebar to that, what is like if people get really scared about sort of making their own krauts, ferments, you know, kefirs, all that kind of stuff. For for someone who wants to get into pickling. Yeah. What would you say is a very basic recipe or basic sort of format that anyone could do? Well, There is a whole chapter <laughs> in comfort and joy. Yeah. But I would say like one of my favorite things to do is um, when things are in season, buy them. Yeah. And um, I do a really simple pickled vegetables. Okay. So you're basically making a brine, mm. you know, salt um, and water and vinegar, like just a white wine vinegar. We could use apple cider if you wanted to bring it up to the boil. You put in the kind of aromatics that you like. You don't even have to. But I always crush a whole like, um, you know, smash a clove of garlic, yeah. a chili, coriander seeds, black peppercorns, maybe a couple of cloves, some mm. peppercorns in there. I think I said that already. That goes into that that brine. And then you slice up your vegetables. And I love turnips, um, beetroots, um, you know, kind of golden, because if you use purple beetroot, you're going to color yeah. the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, cauliflower, carrots, um, apples, pears, you know, they're really qu- yes. sort of qu- crisp raw pears almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Because they fall off the trees sometimes. It's a wonderful way of just using them up. And get them packed into a jar in with your brine while it's still warm and seal up your jar. And you've got that for three, four weeks. Yeah. And you're just eating these like lovely pickled vegetables. Yeah. And I have them as a snack, you know, with a, with a little drink before dinner. Yeah. Um, I'll have them, you know, in, through my salads. They're just wonderful. I love it. I've got this image of you having like a little aperitif with like a little snack. With, some with my of your... cocktail stick. Yeah. yeah. Snack, a stick in my pickles. Absolutely. That's got brilliant. me down. Okay, great. So I snuck in another one there. So a pickles recipe uh, and your pantry. What What's always in your freezer? In my freezer, frozen vegetables. Okay. Uh, I really rate them. I think there's some really fantastic ones. I love, for example, spinach. Uh-huh. Really good. You know, you just want to like make a sauce or something and you just put your, you know, spinach through it. Um, I love those kind of um, chopped up vegetables, frozen peas. Mm. Again, just bulking up things. I love to make soups, kitchdies, that kind mm. of thing, dals. And then I'll often put in handfuls of like vegetables because then you're just, even things like rice, you know, yeah. you make a simple rice and just to put some green peas through it yeah. uh, and sweet corn. I love um, frozen sweet corn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got all those veggies in my freezer. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, And what's in your fridge? What, what do you always have in your fridge? And it can be something unusual. It can be something very basic, whatever. Cheese. Cheese. <laughs> okay, go I, to cheese. Let's go I for just, a section. Do you know what? I'm really spoiled because um, I I work right around the corner from La Fromagerie. Which oh, is yes, you do. Yeah, it's on the same road. <laughs> heaven. It's so good. And Patricia, who runs it, is like my idol. 
Amazing. I want to be her when I grow up. <laughs> She's just incredible. She's a businesswoman who's run her business in Maribyrn for over 35 years. Wow. She was one of the first because Maribyrn was a little bit of a kind of a dry area. And then she came in and the Conran shop came in ah. and then everybody followed. Ah. And so she really is. I mean, just the most extraordinary woman. She's a walking encyclopedia of knowledge when it comes to um, food with provenance. Yeah. Every single item she has in her shop, so over you know, 200 products or whatever, she knows each producer by name and she knows their stories and she will tell you. And, and then when you go into the cheese room, it is like heaven wow. and they make this brie the truffle brie okay. it is insane um and it's like my favorite favorite thing i always have lots and i love a sharp cheddar do you know what i love eating i love eating um i make dal like uh-huh. black dal makhni yeah and i have it with a toasted cheese dippy sandwich no way. it's the best thing and actually what one day while i was eating this like dippy cheesy toasty thing with my bowl of dal i was like this is so good and it ended up me being being the inspiration for me inventing are dal makhni and Montgomery cheddar croquettas. Oh, yes. So we do this incredible croquetta, which oh, we serve gosh. with a carrot achar. Yes. And it's this kind of combination of like the Spanish tradition of making croquettas, mm. so like a bechamel, mm. but then with black, smoky black dal and Montgomery cheddar, and it is heaven. This is why I want everyone to go to your restaurant, uh, because <laughs> every time I go, and I go often, Uh, I'm just sort of blown away by the combination. And I'm just sat there. You like love the mango like, thali. Yeah, I love, <laughs> I love it. I'm just sat there. I'm like, how on earth did somebody conjure this up? This is like insane. This is like beyond, you know, what I could ever do in the kitchen. And it's just like, I- I'm just, I'm so privileged to have had this conversation where I can tap into a bit of your ingenuity <laughs> and understand a bit about your background and what the influences are because you're... Um, Yeah, you're just, you're genius. And it's and it's Aww, wonderful to have been able to cook with you so as well. You're so kind. You're so kind. I just love feeding people. I'm such yeah. a Punjabi. I'm just like, eat, eat, eat. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That was brilliant. Thank That was so you. good. Thank so you good. so much. I really, really appreciate you coming oh, down. Total yeah. and utter pleasure. It was so <laughs> lovely. If you liked that video, then you will love the full library from the Doctor's Kitchen podcast. We talk about inflammation, immune health benefits, and much, much more about food as medicine, including this video right here that you can click through right now.